Kia ora team. Welcome to the event that we're hosting, Studio DB. <coughs> and really, just a quick recap as to why we're here. Our purpose as an organisation is to do more good. And this is our first um, event, guys, that we're running since we've been rebranded last year as Studio DB, originally DB Interiors. And that's really just to align our brand with our full service offering from workplace strategy, aligning um, real estate with <coughs> property and the business objectives. And really, we set on this event just to create real life <coughs> discussion between, obviously, our guests that are with us here today. So thank you very much, guys, for joining us to really give us tips and tricks and <coughs> help us as leaders navigate these times. So firstly, I wanted to um, introduce those with us today. We've got um, one of us is a successful um, rugby um, fanatic and player and also model. I don't know whether you guys can guess who we're talking about, but more to the point, he's a father of four kids and he's done some wondrous things off the field, which some of us may not know about, which includes um, leading two, being part of two charities with um, Sir Richie McCaw and also Ellie Williams, and then also just a great human being in terms of the passion that he has for his family and having time with his kids. So, Dan, welcome to the fold. Pleased to have you with us. Thanks, Jonas, <coughs> um, and also to Studio DB as well for having uh, Nick and I uh, jump on here and, and share a little bit of our experience and, and knowledge um, to, to all the people that have kindly uh, tuned in uh, on this uh, you know, Wednesday morning. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, father of four young boys uh, under the age of eight years. So I need to do more things like this where I can escape and get away and uh, <laughs> talk to you not having little um, sort of children conversations, which are a big part of my day now since uh, since since retiring. So um, obviously, you know, excited to, to be here and, and share a little bit of, you know, the things that I've learned throughout, um, you know, my playing career and, and, and being an All Black for, for 13 years. Yeah, brilliant. <clears throat> and then we've got Nick beside us here. Um, thanks for joining Nick and coming along today. A few of you may not know, but he's actually a gold medalist so although, Dan, I think you're not the only one here, unfortunately, I have no record apart from winning the odd touch tournament at primary school, so I don't really compare to the fold of you chaps here. But also, he's led the transition in terms of um, from the BNZ Bank and Microsoft Teams in COVID times, and really um, <coughs> led the revolution in utilising technology and making sure that BNZ can stay ahead of the pack, really, and continue to innovate and push those boundaries also, he's a Kiwi man also, um, got a couple of kids as well, a boy and a girl, and also enjoys a bit of boating, some family fun, so thanks a lot for joining us. Yeah. Thanks, Janice, and uh, thanks, Dan, for the welcome. Uh, and uh, although um, uh, I was also playing for New Zealand in 2007, it was uh, a little less known than, than rugby. It's a, a sport called water polo, and uh, yeah, really proud to uh, represent my country. And um, yeah, certainly not a, a jockey model, more of a Lululemon guy. But uh, if you're looking uh, in, in any desperate uh, attempts, Dan, then uh, yeah, give me a call. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, fantastic. The event will be around about an hour long. I'm finishing around 10 a.m. There'll be a Q&A session throughout, so feel free to put any questions in the Q&A chat. We'll attempt to answer those at the end. Um, today is about being true, true, actually having a discussion no media, and hopefully you'll find this session helpful to help us lead our teams in challenging times. So without further ado, the first topic that we'll be rolling through is, as leaders and teams, we're trying to play our best in uncertain times. And I guess, Dan, you could probably talk us through some of the things around this one, walking towards pressure. Um, we know the pressure that we're facing, expectations are an all-time high. Um, the technology um, is meaning that people are expecting more of us in terms of times of communication, and also expectations are high. So how do we maintain laser focus on the objective and really achieve what we set out to do so far away? Yeah, it's, it's obviously uh, very challenging times at the moment and and uh, you know, not just uh, you know, for, for businesses, but you know, sport as well. And, and you know, obviously that, that's, that's my specialty. And um, 
you know, back when, uh, you know, COVID hit a couple of years ago, that was the, pretty much the end of my career. Um, I, I'd finished, I, I flew back from uh, Japan to, to be with, with my family and, um, you know, haven't gone back since. And I kind of put everything into perspective about what, what is important uh, in life, um, which was, you know, for, for me was, was family and, and having to, uh, to finally uh, put an end to, to to my career, but I guess you know through these challenging times, and I've been talking to many of the players over the last couple of years, and, and they've been really struggling. Just just that uncertainty um, is probably one of the most challenging things. Where, where you want to plan, you want to focus, you want to set goals, um, but things just keep keep changing on you, and and there is just so much uncertainty. So so how do you how do you plan for that? How do you prepare for that? Is is one of the the things that they're, they're trying to work out. Um, so, what we used to do, because in a game of rugby, the game is full of uncertainty. Whether that's uh, poor referee decisions, uh, whether it's the the. The, um, the opposition playing better than they've ever played before, um, injuries, red cards, um, external uh, influences, weather, whatever it is. There's so much uncertainty that can happen in the game. So what we used to do uh, before the game, it was normally early in the week, we would come together in just our mini units. So that's the nines and tens, it's the front rowers, it's the loose forwards. And we'd start talking about this thing called what ifs. Now, what if was, you know, or what if this happened? What if that happened? And we were trying to prepare ourselves for, for these uncertainties, these things that would happen, because we, we realized that you're never going to go through a, a day or a game where things don't happen that you, you don't expect. So we always expected three things to go horribly wrong in a game, and, and we'd try and prepare for them. Uh, and then later in the week on the Friday, we'd meet as a team and we'd come up with some some what ifs. Okay, well, what if Richie McCaw gets uh, red carded uh, 10 minutes into the game? And we'd talk about it as a team. Okay, well, okay, Kieran Reid, you know, you, you take the captaincy. We're down to 14 men. We slow the game down. We come up with solutions. Okay, well, what if we're what if we're down by eight points um, with, you know, three minutes to play? You know, do, do we take the penalty or do we, you know, try and get the, you know, work to get the try? Um, so having these little conversations. Now, these scenarios might not and often did not come out, you know, or happen in the game. But what it did is it changed our mindset to, okay, well, things are going to happen and we've planned and prepared for it. Um, so it didn't take, get us, uh, you know, on the back foot. So we always expected three things to go wrong in the game. So when... When we did uh, have an injury five minutes into the game with a, one of our key players, it didn't affect us. I was like, okay, cool, that's one. Okay, let, let's just get on with it. And because we've done that work throughout the week, it didn't shell shock us. And we go, okay, right, let's just move on. And, and you just, you kind of almost take that punch and then you go again, okay? Because you're expecting these uh, these things to, to happen and uncertainty. So that was one thing that, that we had. Um, you, you touched a little bit on, on pressure. Um, and it's something I, I struggled with early on in my career, um, was dealing with pressure. I was a young, uh, a young kid, 20 years old, grew up in the country and all of a sudden, you know, I was representing my country in a sport that we're quite fanatical about here in New Zealand. You know, the, the state, the country goes into a wee state of depression if, if we don't win a World Cup. Um, <laughs> Domestic violence goes up uh, if we don't win a, a game. <laughs> Crazy stuff like that. So there's, there's a bit of pressure on our shoulders when it comes to, to performing on a Saturday when you've got the black jersey on. And I, I struggled a little bit. But something that we learned um, pretty early is actually to, to walk towards pressure, embrace it. Um, you know, things are going to be uncertain, but to actually see pressure as being a privilege, it's not a burden, it's a privilege. Um, and the reason I say that is there's these different types of pressure. You know, there's pressure a homeless person on the side of the street has to try and find uh, their meal, um, you know, each day. Or there's high performance pressure where, um, you know, the the decisions you make, um, what you, you know, what you strive towards, 
um, really do matter. There's, there's uh, consequences. So as soon as we learnt, well, hold on, the people that live with that high performance pressure in, in their life each day, they're on the verge of, of success. They're on the verge of achieving things that are really unique and special. So it's actually, it's actually a privilege to have that pressure in your life. And, and as soon as you change your mindset around that pressure and, and embraced it and walked towards it and saw it as a privilege, you almost wanted it in your life. And, and I know that might sound a little bit strange, but I perform my best now when I'm under pressure. You know, I'm being held accountable to, to other people. The decisions that, that I make, there's got to be, you know, serious consequences. I thrive on that and, and really walk towards that. So as soon as we change that um, mentality around privilege and seeing it as, as a as a you know, that pressure, seeing it as a privilege, it, it um, you know, really made uh, life a lot easier. So there are just a couple of little points around sort of uncertainty and, and, and pressure um, that, that, you know, I really learned, uh, you know, certain parts of my career. Yeah, that's brilliant. Interesting what you um, raised there in terms of those what-if what if moments. And I guess in terms of um, thinking about the banking and obviously where connection is so important, heading the workplace yeah. team that's also around the, um, responsible for technology. How did you how did you perform and how did you pull the team together to make sure that you navigated those times so that it was a success for the team? Yeah, so I mean similar to, to building on Dan's message, you know, pressure's different for everybody. And um, uh, I remember I was, I was sitting on a plane going to India uh, for work and uh, I was watching Richie's uh, documentary and I think he frames it uh, similar but, but slightly different in terms of this is what you wanted. Yeah. Uh, and when he was going into World Cup, you know, that, that, that mindset actually really resonated with me. And so when we're presenting to the board or, you know, you're having a webinar with a, uh, the most successful All Black ever, um, that type of stuff, um, actually, you know, this is what you wanted yeah. and, and stepping into that. And I think as, uh, I mean, you touched on the, the fact that, you know, for me, uh, leading the workplace technology team and the properties team just before COVID, Two of the teams that were most fundamentally impacted uh, during that time, you know, we're opening, we're closing, you know, you need to create a safe environment for your people. Uh, and everybody uh, suddenly became uh, really um, dependent on their, uh, on their tooling, you know, the Microsoft Teams, the Zoom, etc. But I, I think our leaders, the leader's role is to bring certainty in that time of, uh, in the time of uncertainty. And so one of the mental models that I like to use is, um, is the kind of triangle of leadership between clear, capable, and motivated. Mm. And so you've got to motivate your team. You've got to understand what, what drives them. Uh, you've got to have the capability. And so you either need to build that inside your team or bring it in. Uh, but clarity is the one as a leader that you need to bring. You know, this is where we're going. This is why we're going there. And that can really resonate with people and, uh, and, and they can hold on to that clarity. Yeah, that's good. And I guess in terms of the... Um in terms of that clarity, sometimes you need courage, right? And actually, Dan, you mentioned it. No doubt you're pretty clear on the goal, um, walking out knowing that the goal was to win the game. But there would have been moments, um, talk us through in terms of some of the um, discussions around challenging the status quo in terms of the team dynamic. I know the style of rugby evolved under your guys' leadership in that period of super success. How did you how did you have really the courage to do that and talk us through some of those discussions that you had? I think you know courage is, is you know a fantastic word. Um, you know it's 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 a very you know bold thing to to have and um, you know there were certain stages of my All Black career where we had to be really courageous. Um, one of them was uh, back in two thousand and four. Um, so 2004 was the, the start of uh, Sir Graham Henry, uh, Steve Hansen and Wayne Smith and they came into the environment and they implemented their coaching plan and, and then near the end of the season they realised that the culture was not up to standard. So they made the, the brave decision to, to actually drop a couple of experienced players completely reshape the All Black culture, really focus um, on the history of the All Blacks, the, the, the whakapapa, you know, the, our ancestry, you know, where the, the team had come to build up to where we are today. And then they really challenged every single player that 
your mission now as an All Black is to enhance the legacy. So you, you soon realize that you're just a custodian of the jersey. You never actually own that All Black jersey while you're playing. You're just a custodian and your sole purpose while you're an All Black is to enhance the legacy, leave the jersey in a better place than it was before. So all of a sudden you you had this this vision and it was, yeah, it was hugely powerful, but for them to to be courageous enough to go, right, we, we need to make change. We need to 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 evolve this culture. We need to to grow it was was a hugely powerful and, and inspiring thing. And I think that was the some of the foundation set for the, the team to be so successful for the, the next uh, two decades. So that was a, a really, um, you know, th that was a lot to do with the vision and purpose, which I know we'll talk a, a little bit about later on. And another one was in 2011. Um, we just won the World Cup, um, first time in, in 20 odd years. It was, but where do we go from that? We've gone from good, a good team to a great team. All of a sudden, we're world champions. So subconsciously, you can relax a little bit. So how do you stay ahead of the pack? How do you stay ahead of the competition? Because historically, every team that has won a Rugby World Cup has had an awful year the following year because they relax. Subconsciously, when it gets tough, they go, oh, actually, well, we won the World Cup last year. It doesn't really matter that much. So how are we as a team going to be courageous and break that tradition? And I still remember it was down in Clearwater Resort in Christchurch, we were meeting with the leadership group and, and the All Black management, and we're trying to work out what is our vision for this team. Okay, not just two, three years, like the next ten years. What is it going to be? Because if we have a, a a vision of winning another World Cup, or hey, let's try and win back-to-back -back World Cups, that wasn't powerful enough. We needed a vision that was really inspiring. I still remember Steve Hansen. He goes, well. We need to be the most dominant team in the history of world rugby. You know, and as Kiwis, you sit here and go, well, really? Like, who are we to say that we should be, we could be the most dominant team in the history of world rugby? You know, that bit of humility comes into you, you go, okay, we're kind of blowing our own trumpet there. But um, but we, when we all bought into that vision, we soon realized, well, to be the most dominant team in the history of world rugby, you don't just have to win the rugby championship and the Bledisloe Cup in 2012. You don't just win the next World Cup. You have to be number one team in the world for the next 10 years. Actually, you don't even get to the end where you put a flag in the ground and go, okay, we're the most dominant team in the history of world rugby. You never actually achieve it, but you're aspiring to, to be there. And that's what's driving you every day you get out of bed is, well, what does a player that's part of the most dominant team in the history of world rugby do each day. So all of a sudden it brings this mindset, this consistency, this, this, yeah, this growth, this challenging each other. And it was probably one of the most important visions of, um, that I've been a part of. And I think that was a huge part of the reason that we were so, so successful for so long, but it took courage to come up with a vision as bold as that. And we never achieved that. Um, we might have come into the conversation, oh, okay, that, that team from 2010 to 2020 was, you know, was, was one of the, you know, the best teams that, that we've seen. Um, so we're in that conversation and it takes courage to make really big, bold um, decisions to do that. But a lot of it is around, um, you know, your vision and, and wanting to, to drive to, to that excellence. Yeah, it's good. I think that probably leads in quite well to the next phase, which we're talking about developing and maintaining a winning culture. Um, and it probably is also plays into some of the pressure, but how in your team, Nick, have you managed to build off the team's strengths um, to really get the extra 1% to 5% of them to make sure that you are, as you say, Dan, um, you're ahead of, the, you're ahead of the, other, the pack, you're ahead of the other competition. How have you done that in your team? And what have been the successes of that? Yeah, so thanks, Jonas. The, um, the, the two um, words I like to use are authenticity and inclusivity. And so authenticity for me uh, means, uh, you know, being who you are. And Dan, you touched on you're just a custodian of the, of the jersey. Um, I think uh, you're just a custodian of your role at, at an organisation. And so you need to be a good person 
um, the role can be gone like that. Your seniority goes, you know, really quickly. You want people to, to you know, trust in you, to believe in you, follow you uh, as a person, and then the role uh, attaches to that. And so for me, I always like to introduce myself as a person first. You touched on that in terms of, you know, father of two, you know, and, and so I'm, I'm, I'm authentic about, uh, I try to be authentic about how I lead. Um, and a couple of things really stood out to me. Uh, my now wife and I, my childhood sweetheart, uh, we were travelling through Central America and then up into, uh, up into the US on our way to London. And the conversations when we were travelling through places like Central or, uh, or up into Europe, it was always about, hey, why are you here? What are you doing? Um, and, and a general interest at a human level. As soon as we went into the US, it was all, um, what do you do? And it was a real um, change in mindset to go, okay, the first thing those people want to know about you is your job. Um, where I like, to, I like to ask my team who they are first, and so you can be, uh, you can be authentic. Uh, on inclusivity, so I think you need to respect and encourage uh, the roles that everybody brings to the team. Uh, I've got a couple of people in my team, uh, one of them I call my barometer, um, she's the one who I can guarantee I can go to with my brilliant ideas and she tells me they're ridiculous and stupid and they're not going to work uh, because they won't work for our customers, they won't work for our colleagues. Uh, I've got another guy who is, um, I guess I call him the encourager. And so uh, when we were looking at culture uh, over lockdown and we're all sick of having Kahoot quizzes or you know, virtual drinks on a Friday afternoon, we decided to do a murder mystery evening, you know, virtually. And, and he was the one who turned up and dressed up and he'd put on an accent and, and he was right into it. And he made everybody feel safe that they could really participate yeah. as well. So uh, those two things about uh, authenticity and inclusivity. And um, uh, role modelling is one. Uh, I, uh, one of my uh, previous leaders um, really left the office early and I said to him, Why, surely you've got heaps of work to do. Why are you leaving the office at uh, you know 4:45, 4:30, whatever it is? And he said, "Because if I don't, nobody else will." And he was giving us the permission to have that flexibility in our life. Uh, and then the last point I'll touch on is is a mantra uh, that a team I used to work with had um, that I've tried to carry forward: is you take your work seriously, but not yourselves. Mm. And so you can have fun. We know that there's time that work absolutely has to happen, and you really need to be serious about that but the culture has to have a bit of fun element in it. You have to know who those people are uh, and you have to play to those, uh, those roles that people bring, bring to the fold. <coughs> yeah, that's good. Sorry, Jonas. It's a hugely important point about actually caring about your team and the culture and the people that, that make that culture. Um, you know, because at the end of the day, we're, we're not robots. We're, we're all humans. We're all yeah. uh, living these these different lives. And, you know, we had a, a value as part of the All Blacks was better people make better All Blacks. And what we meant by that is actually we need to spend time investing in the person, okay, making sure, because that's when, that's when they'll thrive in an environment. That's when they'll add to the culture. If they feel like they're just being boxed in and don't feel valued, then you're not getting the best out of your team and the people around you. Um, you know, so there were many times where I would go and have uh, dinner with Wayne Smith, and here I would, I'd turn up and I think we're just going to talk about rugby the whole time at dinner. We didn't <laughs> even talk about rugby. He was actually just caring about me as a person. I was away from my family over in Japan. He was coaching me over at the time. And, you know, when you see that, that element from, from leaders, coaches, managers, GMs, whoever it is, it makes you want to give back to the culture even more because they know that they care about you as a person. And, and you know, going back to your very first topic about these times of uncertainty, um, I think that human element is, is hugely important in any culture. They actually, we, we care about the, the person first. And if they feel valued, secure, um, feel like that they can can kind of give their thoughts and and you create an environment like uh, like that. It's uh, it's huge, hugely powerful. So I thought that was a great point, Nick. Yeah, and you touched on it about on the team member that help help the team feel safe within the environment. I think that is really important as we move through these next. Um, looking past COVID, look, it's not here to stay. So a lot of the leaders that we're working with are sort of looking that sort of 5, 10, yep. 15 years out. What, is, what do our organisations look like? And we had a discussion, Nick, on um, someone you know quite well about 
buying some land on the North Shore. How long ago was how long ago was that that they did that? Yeah, I mean, uh, this this is about uh, I guess having your not your horizon just fixated on, and I guess for you, Dan, you know, next week on a rugby match or, uh, you know, next year on your strategic outcomes, it's, it's 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago. And if you look at um, some of the ways uh, organisations are, are looking forward, you know, they're buying land 30 years in advance because they know the population's going there. They know that's going to be a key area of, of, uh, of importance. And so you've got to, you've got to keep your eyes up I think we've we've all been kind of eyes down for the last two years because we've had to be. You know, it's changed everybody's lives uh, and and the way that they operate in them. Uh, and uh, but but you have to lift lift back up and keep looking forward. And that's I guess in terms of the um, in terms of environments which foster sort of those candid conversations and allow people to be vulnerable to really challenge the status quo and and really push forward actually some of that bigger picture thinking. Um, no doubt, Dan. When you were doing that, in terms of the team, just covering off on this topic, how how did you create those? Were they you touched on going out for a meal with Wayne Smith? What but what physical environments were those sort of conversations in, or were they more ad hoc? Or talk us through a couple of those. Yeah, it's, I think you need to initially, if, you, if if it's not part of your culture, then it almost needs to to be programmed. And so we'd have these relationship meetings. So at any time. Um, you could just kind of tap anyone on the shoulder and say, like, do you want to catch up for a coffee? And you tr you're just trying to build a build a relationship. And that can be either work or outside of work. And, um, you know, when you're building up these little one-on-one -on -one relationships, so, uh, for example, I am I play number 10. Obviously, my, the two key guys for me are, you know, my, my nine, my halfback, and my... Uh, second five eight, my number twelve, because they are my eyes and ears. The other guys I work with the most, so I need a super strong relationship with them. But actually, I need a really good relationship with the lock as well, who's calling the line out. So I need to make sure that we're on the same page. So I'd often tap him on the shoulder, have a coffee, and uh, you know we talk about rugby. Or um, you know, often you'd only talk with rugby for about ten minutes, and then because you've made that effort to go have a coffee, you actually learn a little bit more about them as a person as well, and, and you're building building that relationship. Um, but what we started to do when we started talking about culture and you know diversity, making sure everyone's included in, in this environment is, you know, we had a lot of different uh, cultures within the all black culture. Yes, we have an all black culture, but then we have within that, we have Samoans, so they've got their own culture, heritage, um, Fijians, uh, we even had some Australians, South Africans, um, some some Pakeha. We had all sorts of different cultures, so we made a real effort to to bring them in. So I've been in too many teams where the island boys would just go hang out with themselves. Um, the boys that loved I don't know rock music would go just sort of chill out. By themselves. <laughs> um, you know, and it was, it was really um, segregated culture. So well, we needed to change this. So we uh, would have cultural evenings where we'd drink kava. You know, all of us, um, you know, we would sing, um, you know, Samoan songs, you know, so we're actually making every different culture part of this, this all black um, culture and, we, and we'd embrace it and we'd, we'd enjoy it um, to the extent where we got, you know, a bit of string for every different culture that was part of the all black environment, you know, so we'd have a white piece of string for, for Fiji, a blue for Samoa, yellow for Australia, you know, Steve Devine and the, and the team is a, <laughs> an Australian um, heritage. So, and we realized that with all these different colored string, we would tie them together and make a, a rope because we realized that a rope is so much stronger than a piece of string. And basically what we're doing is we were bringing all the different cultures together to make an all black culture. And we'd travel all around the world um, with this rope. We'd hang it in the changing room, we'd hang it in our in our team room, and it just represented that we embraced everyone's um, culture. It doesn't matter um, where you come from, what your beliefs were, anything like that. You know, you're welcome in, in the all black environment. And and having that that diversity, all inclusivity in, in the the culture, it's like what we talked about before, you, you want to be a part of that culture, you, you want to, to, to kind of deliver, you, you want to 
um, give everything you possibly got, and and that's when you know the, the team starts firing when when you have that uh, you know that belief and 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 that understanding and in, in a world class uh, culture like the All Blacks. I'll see if I can uh, get a Carver evening past the health and safety team <laughs> uh, back at back at the office once we're all back in. Uh, that's good. And then in terms of the um, in terms of let's touch on resilience. I mean, for the audience. I think, Dan, you're actually meant to be um, beside us or in between Nick and I. Um, unfortunately, one of the sons got a bit of COVID. But in terms of actually moving forward and really adding, adding, you touched on <coughs> how you had that rope, building off failures to really strengthen the team moving forward. And then I guess, Nick, from your point of view, that also can play into sort of the work-life balance and how some of the teams have been under immense pressure, obviously, through this time. So how do, how do as leaders, how do we build the resilience, not just within ourselves, but culture, breed it into the culture so that the team are resilient um, so the pressure doesn't only lie with the leaders? Help us with that. Yeah, sure. So um, I'll, I'll kick off. Um, so I think uh, resilience uh, is, is relative. Right, so there's all sorts of stuff that goes on around the world. You know, there's the Ukraine crisis going on at the moment. You know, World Cup uh, kicking goals right down to an office job. The relativity of of resilience, it, like, it doesn't make it less important because that's what's going on in in your day. Um, and I, I think, or I like to think about it in terms of not everyone's starting from the same base. And a, a question for me is how how full are you before you've started your your day job yep. in terms of you might have been cut off in traffic. You might have had uh, the kids yelling at you, or um, you know you got sick parents you need to be taken care of, or you might have had an amazing sleep and a great exercise in the morning, and you're starting off on a on a really kind of kind of uh, you've got a lot of space um, to play with, and uh, so I think you really need to understand where your team members uh, or where yourself is coming from. So ha- how resilient are you at the at the start of the day? An example for me. Um, uh, so my mum was a teacher, uh, deputy principal here in, here in Auckland, and uh, we had these. Uh, she had these kids every Thursday morning or every fortnight on the Thursday. They would come in late, you know, and they started like, "Okay, why are you late? Come on, you know, get to get to school." And then once you actually start asking the questions, you understand why they're late, and it's because they got their wins payment. The mum got their wins payment on Wednesday nights at midnight, and so by Wednesday they'd actually run out of money. And they had to wait till midnight until that payment came through for them to go to the supermarket or whatever and, and have dinner. And so they always slept in on Thursday mornings. Mm. And so I think you really got to understand where your team's coming from um, and what's going on in their lives to understand how they might react to a certain situation. Because if you've got heaps of space, <clears throat> excuse me, to deal with to deal with the the challenges that are going on in the day, you're not going to necessarily just snap at one little thing. Mm. But if you're immediately full when you start your day and someone turns up late to a meeting, that might be the, enough to push you over the edge. Um, and so if everyone's not starting at the same position, everyone's not responding in the same way. And so um, you, I think you also need to understand what your team and what yourself uh, responds to. And so as being part of a large corporate, uh, you know, we get put on training sessions. I'm not sure it's at the same uh, caliber and level that uh, the All Blacks go through, but, um, you know, we had a mindfulness and resilience a workshop that we went through and and the outcome was okay we'll you know download a meditation app and 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 try that and it, they tried to put the same thing across for everybody and I said well that actually doesn't work for me I don't have trouble sleeping but the times that I regain my strength and regain the space to be resilient is out on the uh, mountains hunting or out fishing or spending time at the batch with the kids and so I think you need to find the space that you've got, how do you re-energise it and, and what specifically works for you and your um, and your team? Yeah, it's good. It is a, I totally agree in terms of just making sure that you're going out of your way to understand what the team are facing because um, going back to the beginning, what we're discussing is it's not just about the job, is it? Yeah. It's not about your role. It's about, it's about you as a person and also making sure that you can understand the person outside of the role, so that if something really important um, happens, mm. and it might be, it might be small in some of the other team members' eyes, but you understand really what are the key drivers from the person outside of the day to day, making sure you can tap into that. And I guess Dan, you can probably discuss 
how, I mean, we can all remember, I know exactly where I was sitting in 2011 um, when you hit the deck. And I know we discussed last week that being quite a dark period for you. How did you, just even within yourself, make sure that you you actually found, I guess, some, some of the leaders, um, Simon Sinek talks about finding your why outside of rugby. Talk us through, just at a personal level, how you needed to respond to make sure that you come back to the really top in terms of the role and your position as number 10? Yeah, it's, um, yeah, never assumed that everyone can remember what happened in 2011, um, but it was a, a very joyful year for the All Blacks where we finally won a, a Rugby World Cup. But for me personally, um, I got injured uh, a week before the quarterfinal, um, doing something that I've done millions of times throughout my career, uh, kicking goals. Uh, it was a pretty proud moment for my family and I. Uh, earlier that day, I got named to, to captain the All Blacks for the first time. Um, did the press conference, did the captain's run, which I got to take for the first time ever. It was quite a, a special moment. Only at the end of that uh, captain's run, um, while I was having uh, some kicking practice, I kicked the ball and dropped to the ground and uh, ruptured my uh, groin muscle. Um, and I knew from that moment my World Cup was finished, gone. Um, that was going to be my last World Cup. That was my third World Cup, and I thought um, that I might go and play uh, overseas after that. I'd achieved everything I'd, I'd want, wanted to, um, and then all of a sudden it was it was taken from me. Uh, so going back about that uncertainty, you have to realise in the life that we live, we're going to have setbacks. Uh, everything isn't perfect but it's how you deal with these setbacks that really define you uh, as a person. And I think the person that I am today is, is because of the injuries and the setbacks and the challenges that I've had to face is, is built up this resilience in me. And I have a few tools in my kit now to, to help me deal with, with setbacks. So uh, going back to that day in, in 2011, I was in a pretty dark place. Um, I always was a firm believer of things happen for a reason. Um, two years earlier, I ruptured my Achilles tendon. I knew that I was just playing too much rugby. And that was my body telling me I needed to rest. But all of a sudden with this injury, it didn't make any sense at all. It's like, why me? Why such a serious injury? Why do I have to, does it have to happen now in the middle of a World Cup? Um, you know, I'm really feeling sorry for myself. Um, and I often see people with injuries or setbacks and they kind of just shut it out and start thinking positively. And I think that's really dangerous because it will catch up with them later on in, in life or further down the track if, if they don't deal with it. So I always give myself this 24 hour, um, kind of like a healing process where I vent a little bit. You know, I cried, I uh, talked to my teammates, I went silent, I was angry, I had all the emotions. I was not a nice person to be around. Um, but that was just me dealing with um, what had just happened. And it was, it was my grieving process. But I knew at the end of my 24 hours, I needed to snap out of it. And how I did that was I looked back at my, my vision. Now, my vision was um, not to be just an All Black, but to be an All Black great. And I learned that from my very first test match when my dream was to be an All Black. I achieved that and I walked off the field after my first test match and I go, that's not enough. I don't want to be just an all-black. I want to be an all-black great. And um, that was for, you know, that, that was what was driving me throughout my all-black career. So all of a sudden I've got this injury. And I was like, well, what does an all-black great do in, in times like these? Well, you know, he bounces back. He comes back stronger. He works harder than he's ever worked before. He resets his, his goals. Okay, this is going to be your last World Cup. Well, no, it's not. You're going to play one more World Cup four years later. Resigned a, a new contract for another four years to give myself another crack at a World Cup in 2015. Um, so resetting my goals was a really big one. Reminding myself of my vision, uh, my purpose uh, was another key thing. And then just being really positive after that grieving process was, was key for me. Um, so a couple of really key points. Time to grieve is, is really important. And then uh, resetting your goals and just reminding yourself, well, what is your, your purpose and, and your vision? And they were two things that really helped um, help me get out of that really sticky um, point of 
you know, feeling sorry for myself. Um, and when I've had injuries after that, I would always go back to those, okay, I'm not going to be a nice person for 24 hours, um, but I'm going to reset, <laughs> reset my goals. I'm going to work harder. I'm going to write down exactly what my goals are. What do I need to achieve? And I became so rendimented in, in making sure that, that I achieve those, that I would write down my weekly goals, my daily goals, um, my tournament goals, my yearly goals, just so I had a really clear vision of where I needed to, to get to. It was, um, yeah, a couple of things that really helped me with, with those, uh, those big setbacks. Yeah, that's good. Um, and I guess from, I mean, we, we all, let's face it, we all have setbacks um, for some of us that are less public they don't really play out in the press sort of on live updates and live feeds as immediately as they happen. But in terms of moving forward, and for some of those in the audience, you're probably wondering why we set on these events and how does this link to our space in which we play. And for a major part of our industry and people in the audience, we're wondering what is the new normal? Um, as, as we breed culture, how do we do that? And that's still a moving target. Um, and going back to what we we're discussing, having a strategy year one, two, three, five, ten. Um, <clears throat> in terms of workspace and returning, re returning back, what do you think as a as a B and Zeta, What do you think that may be? And taking the learnings from today, what where's your head at, head at Nick, in terms of where that's at? Yeah. So so as a, as a company, I, I think we've all seen the benefits of uh, working at home. Um, you know, and uh, you know, being able to see your kids during the day when you pop out for a cup of tea. I think we've all seen the downsides of working at home. You know, being able to see your kids during the day. Um, <laughs> as a, as a, yeah. uh, I've got a two and a four year old, and they bang on the door, and the, you know, my wife does the best job possible to try and keep them under control. Um, but I guess in all seriousness, we know people want to return to the office. We know uh, that they want to come back and get that social connection again. Mm. Um, we've seen that through um, through a lot of the uh, surveys that we've done or the conversations that, that we've had. Um, and I think everyone would have seen that, uh, uh, the kind of picture that went around the internet when COVID was first happening. You know, what's the biggest impact to your digital transformation? Is it your CEO? Is it your culture? Is it the CTO? And obviously it was COVID, right? I would love that actually we see that again, but the picture says what's been the biggest impact to your culture? you know, your CEO, your CTO, uh, or COVID. And when we're, you know, if we fast forward 12 to 18 months and we're going, everybody has, has come back in in terms of uh, being part of the organisation, uh, getting that social connect, uh, connection, uh, being part of the culture, that, that would be awesome. And so we know that the space that we've got needs to earn the commute off our people. You know, and we've got, you guys got a lovely premise here uh, that, want, that makes people want to come in and spend time um, but the, the real tricky part now for us is to manage the customer outcomes that they need, our colleague outcomes, um, but also the, uh, the company's outcomes mm. in terms of we've still got to drive forward, we've still got to be uh, in business, we've still got to put our customers first, uh, which means that we can't just go, hey, you can do whatever you want. Mm. So we're just working through that at the moment and we're, uh, we're reshaping some of our premises to, uh, to make it, uh, I guess, more colloquial um, rather than a stale office environment. We're reshaping the technology to uh, be more equitable uh, and, and we really want that uh, connected culture. Mm. Yeah, that's good. And I guess in terms of we're seeing, um, we've got the privilege of having a few strategists around the world um, in the UK and Aussie and America to name a few where they're located and we're even seeing it is a combination of things that can play into what does that look like in terms of length of lockdown. We can remember um, what we had here around the country, but for areas like Victoria where there's extended periods of lockdown, we saw a major bounce back to a new normal, which was quite similar to pre-COVID, but then we can see the adjusting back. So I think as we move through that and the changing dynamic, I think yeah. we'll we've, probably we've, check we've out. Seen, we've seen the same thing. So the places that have had the longest or the most frequent lockdowns have a really slow burn back into the uh, into the office. And the places that, uh, like Christchurch, as an example, um, uh, they just bounce back pretty much straight in, straight into it. Yeah, that's good. And you'll notice some of the um, some of the polls running through. We're going to be sharing that data back. And I guess in terms of space, Dan, you're probably getting used to not 
not playing on a green pitch 100 metres long. Um, but over to Q&A, and I guess in terms, um, this is one for Dan, is how do you keep your team, stay on the course and keep focused on the everyday um, piece when the journey's so long and the milestones are spread out? How do, how do you do that? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a really good question and, you know, something that I'm pretty keen to talk about is actually controlling your mind. Uh, so your, your mental strength is just as important as your physical strength. And it took a while for us to, to realize this. Um, we were spending multiple hours out on the training field. We were spending multiple hours in the gym, but we weren't spending enough time on our mental strength, controlling our mind. And we got a bit of a wake-up call in 2007, a uh, very dark day where we uh, lost to the French team in the quarterfinal uh, in 2007. Now, I talked a little bit earlier about the transformation we made in the culture in 2004, and we've been hugely successful up until 2007. And then all of a sudden, we came against a team where we struggled. We, we had no answers, and we soon learned that we, we didn't like pressure. And... Uh, and it was, it was just too much for us. Um, so we realized from 2007, we weren't spending enough time on our, our, our mental strength. You know, we weren't understanding why we struggled when the pressure came on us. So that's when we came out with the, the pressure as a privilege, worked towards it. But we changed a whole lot of things about learning about our mind. And one of the biggest things we learned was the amount of energy we used to lose uh, thinking about the future or thinking about something that had happened in the past. So a real, we needed a real focus on now, now focus, being present. What is, what is the task that I need to do now to achieve, you know, to walk towards uh, our vision and goal? Because far too often we were thinking, okay, I go back to that example in 2007, we were looking at the scoreboard going, oh man, we might lose oh man, oh, we can't do anything. All of a sudden we started thinking about the outcome and we forgot about the process. Well, what is the process? Okay, just catch the ball, run hard, tackle, really simple things. So um, I guess that's something to really help you each day is to have a real now focus, a real process. What is the process? Because the outcome will take care of itself. And far too often we're thinking about the outcome. Um, and, and that works in, in business as well. So having a real now focus. Another one was controlling your mind is, is knowing when you're distracted or being put off task, okay? When um, we call it redhead, bluehead, okay? So when you're um, in a state of a bluehead, you're really clear, you're making good decisions, you're living in the now, and when you're in the red, um, you know, you, you've got three traits. You can freeze, you can flight, or you can fight. And you often see this, and you're always one of those three characters. And if you ever think about it now, when you put under pressure or something goes wrong, you'll do one of those three things. For me, I was always freeze. So my teammates knew that when I'd gone quiet on the field, it's because my head was in a, in a state of red. Other guys, used to play a lot with Ma Nonu, he would fight. <laughs> and literally he would fight sometimes on the field he would argue at the referee and there are other players that that would flight they want to get out of there okay the, oh, oh my hammy's a bit tight oh uh, i think i think i'm injured oh, i want to get out of there so the thing is you'll never go through a day or a game where you're not in a state of red okay but the key is to know when you're in a state of red and get back to the blue so you need techniques to control your mind breathing um, was, was a big part of that, actually going external. I used to slap myself on my leg. Um, if you've ever watched a game and seen me slap yourself on my leg, it's because I'm, I'm in the state of redhead and I'm trying to get back to blue. Um, I've, just missed, I've just missed two shots at goal. I'm at the back of my run-up about to have my third attempt and I start thinking, you've missed the last two. Um, geez, you're probably going to miss this one too. And I need to go external. I need to like whack myself and go, right, no, focus. What, what, breathe. Go through your routine, live in the now focus. So knowing that whole red head, blue head. So this is all the work that we were doing um, on our mental strength and a lot um, of breathing exercises as well. So I think that that really helps you with um, focusing on the process. 
Because if you start thinking too far about all those diff different lofty goals that you're wanting to achieve in the future, you trip up on it, on uh, you know, what you need to do directly now, today. Um, so that was that was a huge understanding and learning that, that we went through off the back of a, a really poor result in 2007 is actually working on our mental strength and having tools to help us live in the now and, and achieve everything on a, on a daily basis. Yeah, it's good. Good to, good to hear. Um, and then I guess for Nick, just another one that's come in, customer first or people, and how do we balance these two stakeholders? This is a good, good question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for putting that through. Um, I'll try not to slap myself in the office too much if uh, my <laughs> team or colleague are, are watching this um, uh, and try and stay out of the redhead state. But uh, it, it has to be customers first. Um, without customers, we can't employ the people. Uh, and, and that goes back to uh, what you were talking about earlier, Dan, your, your why. Um, so we're really uh, customer orientated at BNZ. You know, our, uh, we're here to serve customers and uh, help our communities prosper. And so how do you balance it? Um, well, our customers, I guess, pay, pay for all of the, um, the, the salaries that, that, that we can give people. And you have to ingrain that into, into your why. And we're here for those people, and that enables us to focus uh, to focus on our colleagues or, or our people. I think as, as the question came through, so uh, for me that it's it's pretty black and white in terms of which one's first. How do you um, uh, how do you how do you um, pick which one you you know you you're prioritising? Uh, when we're thinking about how we're managing in the hybrid world in terms of our post COVID culture. Uh, our our decision making um, our framework that we're pulling together and, and thinking about at the moment, customers is the first thing on the out on the outer outer ring, right? So uh, just because I want to work from home 100% of the time, or work from the office 100% of the time, or I want to go and live in Hawaii, which by the way is only an hour time difference. So if anyone's looking at a place to uh, go and work remotely, um, it can be quite a good one. Uh, it has to be. Uh, customers first, right? And so if, if that doesn't work for our customers, then we can't have you doing that. Yeah. Uh, and then it comes through, does it work for your team? You know, does it work for your stakeholders? And uh, and then does it work for you? So it has to be customers first, but it's it's a really hard thing to uh, to balance. That's good. Um, and then just a couple more. In terms of um, Dan and both, both of you have been um, sportsmen, and the time has changed many Faced with complete new choices for jobs or businesses, and both of you have had to go from a, a sporting um, career to other opportunities. What what's some key advice around helping us make that change? And, and it may not be just for jobs or businesses, but even different choices it, personally uh, away from our role um, altogether. Dan, throw it to you first. It's, it's a process I've been going <laughs> through uh, ever since hanging up my my boots. Um, you know, I, I had a a long career and I'm extremely grateful to, to be able to play uh, you know the, the sport that I love professionally for as long as I did 18 years so I knew what my purpose was it was to, to be the best rugby player I possibly could so I knew every day that I got out of bed that that was what was driving me all of a sudden that's taken away from you you retire feel like that's that's all you know what's next it's, it's quite a daunting uh, daunting situation to be in. I know that can happen in, in the workforce as well, or you just want to, you feel like you need a change. And a lot of athletes really struggle with that change. Um, so I went through a, a repurposing um, exercise with a guy, uh, Kevin Roberts, who's the old uh, CEO of Saatchi and Saatchi. And it was really confronting, really challenging. Um, but basically, he stripped me right back. You know, we started, okay, well, what was it about rugby? What are the values of rugby that you love, that you'd love to take into this next chapter of your life? Okay, now you've got to work out who you are, what's your character, what are your beliefs, things that, you know, that you'll never do. Um, you know, what is it that's going to be driving you in this next chapter? So it's almost repurposing, finding out what you love and, 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 and who you are as a person, and it really helps you, give you direction. Um, so all of a sudden I've got this framework now and it helps me with my decision making. So I get an opportunity, whether it's to invest in a business or whatever it is, well, does it stick within my pillars, the things that I'm really passionate about that, that I want to focus on 
um, you know, this next chapter in my life. So I think repurposing is, is a really important part of that transition of when you're finishing something and wanting to go into something new or want a new experience. You need to work out that you're doing it for the right reasons because you're, you're passionate about. So, um, you know, repurposing is, was, it was a really big thing for me to, to help, you know, me get through this, this transition when, when something is, is taken away from me. Yeah, brilliant. And over to you, Nick. Yeah, thanks. Um, probably uh, just to build on that, I think the thing that you need to take from sport into your corporate or business business world is the disciplines that you learn uh, through that. And, um, you know, certainly for water polo, it was up at five in the morning, you know, and then uh, uh, certainly for us, uh, we got the the worst pool times because New Zealand swimming was uh, being particularly successful at that time. So, you know, you'd finish your training at 10 o'clock at night and have to be back up at five in the morning. And so the organisational disciplines that you that you learnt through that uh, and the the drive and desire for uh, to overcome challenges, I think are the things that you need to take through into, in, into, your, um, uh, into the business world. Yeah, it's good. And I guess in terms of... Um, in terms of when you played in Japan, Dan, how did you um, make yourself contribute to the team that had a different culture or language? How did you um, make sure you added, added, added value? Yeah, that was, it was, Japan was okay because we had a whole lot of Kiwi coaches uh, run by Wayne Smith, um, but France had its real challenges. Um, going, you, you do things here in uh, New Zealand, you know, the All Black culture, environment, even your super rugby teams. And then you go to a completely different uh, culture like France. So you couldn't get three different cultures in, in New Zealand, France and, and Japan. But something that I really learned is you can't just go and implement what you did here in another culture. Oh, but we did this with the All Blacks. We should be doing this. We should be doing that. So I spent the first um, three months just listening just understanding their culture and then slowly I'd implement just little things. Oh, how about we try this? Oh, how about we do this? Um, because there's been far too many players from New Zealand and they're just so frustrated. They go there and they're like, oh, we should be doing this. We should be doing that. And of course, when you're trying to completely change a culture that has, you know, so much history and behind it, you're, you're just going to bang your head against the wall. So that was a really good learning learning for me is actually just how can you fit into that culture and slowly add value rather than completely trying to, to, to reshape it. And then we had you know, a similar process in, in Japan because you know we went from New Zealand where the players, they're running all the, um, all the meetings. Okay, so the game plan, the defensive structures, it's the players up there that are presenting, it's the coaches careful what I say here, um, they didn't do a lot of the presenting. And they did all the coaching behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, but they, they knew, and credit to the coaches, it was a big transition they made. The coaches knew that it was the players out there playing. So once the game started, they needed to be the ones that were making the decision. So it needed to be the players driving the week. Um, so all of a sudden you go to an environment or a culture like Japan where – that's not part of the Japanese culture. They are very quiet, they're reserved, they need to be told what to do. Um, so we're trying to, 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 you know, make these subtle changes to actually get the Japanese players to realize that um, they need to contribute, that they need to speak, they need to let us know what they're thinking so we can, can grow. And so I, I guess the biggest learning for me was actually not trying to completely reshape or necessarily what we do here in New Zealand is, is the best, but there are little elements from one culture that you can implement, um, you know, in, in, other, in other cultures. Yeah, that's good. And I guess in terms of we have to, there's one more question that we have to ask is what was the All Blacks culture for poor performance in terms of you just lost a game, um, one that we had all expected you to win, of course, <laughs> um, because there was no option. Just briefly, I know we're probably running a bit over time, but just briefly in terms of run us through what was what was the AB's culture for that? Yeah, it was the changing room was probably the most sombre places um, that you'd ever see um, after a, a loss, uh, whether it was a 
an unexpected loss. They're all unexpected losses, to be honest, because we're expected to win every single game. Uh, but, you know, some games are a little bit more important than others that, that we lost. Um, in particular, you know, a couple of World Cups early in, in, in my career. But they're pretty um, tough places. That, but seriously, by come Sunday and Monday, the energy and enthusiasm uh, within the group, because you learn so much more from a loss. And it doesn't mean you should relax after you win. Um, but you learn so much from a loss. So there needs to be a sense of humility of like, okay, we you, we didn't achieve what we wanted to, but now we need to learn. Okay, do we need new skill sets? What was it? And one of the key points that we always learnt with uh, a setback or a loss is often you, there could be eight different things that we could have done differently, but what are the critical few? Okay, so you need to find out what are the two or three things that we need to focus on that will make the biggest change next week. Because if you're trying to do lots of little things, um, you, you'll struggle. Okay, so what are the two or three things of most importance, the critical few, that we'll focus on this week that will help um, change, change the result? And the same goes for the things that Nick and I are talking about. We've covered so much in the, the last hour, and for everyone listening, I think it's important that you don't try and take in everything and try and implement everything <laughs> that we're talking about. Yeah. But what are the critical two or three things that have really stuck out for, that could make uh, a difference in, in your culture or or you personally? Um, yeah, rather than you know trying to, to pick out a, a whole lot of things. And, and often it'll be as simple as that, but there was a real energy after those setbacks it, it took a bit of you know a couple of days to to absorb um and then you know would be absolutely you know rearing to go come uh, come monday yeah well, brilliant well finally thanks a lot nick and dan for joining us um i guess in terms of behalf of the team from studio db our purpose is to do more good that's why we picked um both of you to come and add value to the audience which we've seen some comments coming in and just finally wrapping up on that finding your purpose is really important. Ours is to do more good. And there's a couple of the team internally which have been working extremely hard over the last couple of weeks actually forming a calculator to understand what is the carbon footprint of an office. So from whether it be needed demolition or um, new infrastructure, including furniture. And it was just something that we wanted to extend to the audience too. Um, I know that we've been collaborating with a few of the leaders in the country. It's one of a kind. Just we understand sustainability, it links right in with doing more good. And the first step is actually understanding what is what is that um, <coughs> carbon footprint of the office. So I was talking to the team this morning and they said, well, that was something that they wanted me to mention. So if you want to reach out to the team, feel free. We can run you through some of the sessions that will be coming out in the next couple of weeks. And finally, again, Dan, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for the value you've added. Very much appreciated. And yeah, thanks for having us.